Hello and welcome to our video about OER Camp Web Talks and OER Camp Summer School, two best practices and one reuse strategy. This is Christine Hirschmann. She's the project lead of the OER Camp and she has been the project lead since 2019 maybe. But what is actually important is before COVID-19 because we can divide the OER Camp history between what happened before COVID and what happened then. Yeah, and this is Joran Mus Merholz, and he is the inventor of the OER camps. But actually, the, the OER camps were always a team and a community effort. So we're the two faces talking in front of the camera, but there's a great community behind the idea. We're just the two guys in front of the camera. I will start with a short overview on what actually are OER camps. In case you have seen our talk, our talk on last year's Open Ed, you already know this, skip the next five minutes for all the others. I would like to explain what actually are OER camps, so I have to start with what actually are bar camps or unconferences, because the OER camp started as a pure bar camp. A bar camp is something between a conference, but an unconference, and a coffee break, but not a coffee break. So it seems to be hard to explain, but actually it's not. We started it in Bremen, which is a small town in northern Germany, in 2012. And the OER camps then had different partners, so maybe you can see some logos there. So we gathered some people interested in the topic of OER, which then was really new in Germany. So Germany was, you could say, somewhat uh, a late bloomer in, in terms of OER. And in OER camp, this is uh, some years later in Berlin, bigger stage, as you can see. Um, it was always a bar camp. And a bar camp means that people come to a conference without a schedule, without a program. So it's only in, like you could say, an empty schedule. So um, it starts with people meeting in the morning or in the evening at the beginning of the conference. And everyone who has a topic or only a question steps up, goes to the stage and says, okay, my name is, for example, Joran. I am interested in this topic. I prepared two slides, or I only have a question. And then everyone interested in the same topic and the same question joins this workshop, with, which, which is not called a workshop, it's a session in Barcamp language. So this is, uh, you have to just put in the title for your session and your name and uh, we organize it that you can choose, do you need a projector or do you need, I don't know, people sitting around in a circle or something like this. And uh, you can do it digitally or just uh, on a pin board and have the ideas written there and you then have a schedule with different rooms and different time slots. So. This again is a picture from the first OER camp in Bremen, um, the meeting in the morning. And if you take a really close look, you see the people raise their hands. This is the question, who's interested in this session? Um, a session can take place when there are two people in the room interested in the same topic. So it's not that you need, I don't know, at least 10 people for a session, it's just to know, okay, we have to use a smaller or bigger room for this session. So this is a really small session and uh, again it can be enough if two or three people are interested in the same questions and it's a great way to find the two people interested in the same question in a room of 200 or 300 people. Some numbers on OER camp. This is um, the state of January 2020, so the last month before COVID-19 hit the educational scene and uh, we by then had eight years of OER camps with 480 sessions. This is the bar camp format. We also organized workshops. We had 300 workshops uh, up to then. More than 3,200 participants. Um, they also produced resources during these OER camps. So we had 77 published resources as OER developed during the OER camps. So this is what was the state before COVID came. The OER camps developed somewhat organically, but we found out that they are really good for several purposes. This is qualification, so competencies on OER, mainstreaming, bringing, spreading the word on OER to more and more people in education. Uh, it's networking, it's exchanging uh, knowledge, experiences, of course. Um, it's actually more than we thought in the beginning 
about actually creation of resources because people coming together say, ah, okay, we can work together on this. We developed a special format um, which was more a workshop in the sense of producing resources. And a bit, it's about the culture of sharing, so about people sharing their questions, their experiences, and of course their resources. Now we'll um, hand over to Christine. She will tell you about what happened when COVID-19 hit and we developed the OACM Web Talks. So in spring 2020, we really needed to rethink our formats and our events. Um, and the format of the OER Camp Web Talks was highly shaped by the COVID situation at that time. That means we really wanted to give tangible know-how to educators needed at that time. So imagine teachers and university staff switching to distance learning and also higher educational institutions just locking down. So people in a complete new situation, they needed to teach, other people needed to learn and there were many, many question marks. So yeah, we wanted to give needs-based support basically and we wanted to provide the educators with what they needed and gave them the OER Camp Web Talks. So you can say that we were some kind of OER superheroes for educational practitioners at that time. And now you might ask yourself what are the OER Camp Web Talks? So you can say they are webinars about digital and open educational resources and we provided both basic knowledge of OER, but also advanced knowledge of OER. And for the OER Camp Web Talks, we had two seasons. So one season took place around April 2020, and then we had another season lasting until January 2021. So it was almost one year. And one season existed out of five episodes, no, not five episodes, five um, main topics, and each main topic had five episodes. So in total, with all these seasons, we had at the end 100 webinars, 100 episodes of OER Camp Web Talks. Um, yeah, what was special about it is that during this period of time, so it was five weeks and another five weeks, in total, just to make it a little bit uh, easier, I just speak of 10 weeks, we had episodes every working day. So you could just look at the topics, you can see an overview here with the colorful tiles just behind me, and you can look it up. Okay, so Friday is the day about OER and video and audio production. So that's interesting for me because I wanted to create some teaching videos and then you can tune in on every Friday for five weeks and now there is some knowledge that I can need. That's very interesting. Also on the colorful tiles behind me you see cool people doing funny, making funny gestures and they are our OER camp coaches. So they are very trust fully people and we worked with them beforehand before the COVID situation as well and what's special about them is that they are they are professionals in their field of knowledge and they are also a professional in OER. So just coming back to my example of video and audio production we have Kai you see here him at uh, the very last tile and he is an expert in audio and video production and he's also an expert in audio and video production and OER. So this is basically want, what we wanted to give the educationness. Now I will introduce you to some topics. So here are some further tiles you can see and they were all in total. And the topics the OER Camp Web Talks were about were, for example, open source alternatives for your own infrastructure. So just imagine, for example, a teacher being at home 
having to dig into digital technical infrastructure and this web talk really provided it with basic information with basic support and yeah helping information links all you needed to get started with your own infrastructure then we also had interactive exercises with h5p we also had free teaching materials for teachers of course there were tons of teachers asking themselves where they can find materials. We also have collaborative online learning. Just imagine a bunch of learners being in an online environment and yeah, collaborative learning seems to be a good start and to look into it. We also had creating online courses, of course, seems a bit obvious as well. And we had digital making and as I already mentioned in my example, getting started with video and audio production. So, I have some statistics um, to give you an overview. These are the numbers until January 2021. And you see the participants of the two, so two seasons sum up to almost 15,000, <laughs> almost sum up to 1,500 participants and the episodes in total were 100 as I already mentioned and the YouTube views until January 2021 were approximately yeah 14,000 YouTube views. So this is our first part. We have 100 videos, we had these web talks, webinars and since we have these videos, we also use them. And what we are using them for, what we were using them for, this will tell Joran you in the next part. Summer 2020 was the time when we had finished our first series of five, or actually five series of web talks. So we had 50 web talks and we thought, okay, how can we bring this to more people? Because the webinars were gone. There was the recording of the webinars, but there were many, many demands on how can we learn with this webinars. So we started what we called the summer school. I don't know, in Germany, most people like the word games, the punning with OER. So it was the summer school. And um, we had the idea of bringing these videos together with other resources, together with practices in the form of online courses. So it was maybe not massive open online courses, but small open online courses. And we asked our coaches from the webinars if they could redo their webinars into an uh, online course. And what was interesting, most of them wanted to, but not all of them could do it in the short um, period of time that we had back then in summer, because we really had a high demand from uh, mostly German teachers that were looking for um, ways to increase their competencies on working with digital and open materials. So um, the OACAM Summer School was not only developed by the coaches that already had done the webinars, but with other coaches that took over. And this is our first case of reuse, of maybe two cases of reuse, because we could take the videos and make something new out of it, online courses. And it did not have to be um, the same people. So we could have um, the reuse be done by new coaches. Just some insights on, on the topic of the courses. In 2020, we had um, a course on creating online courses. Uh, we had a course on open web tools for open education. Uh, one course was, uh, was called Getting Started with Video and Audio Production. We had a course on H5P. We had a course on 100 great OER resources and one on OER Explained. So if you count it, it was already one course more than we had webinar series, six instead of five. Um, some numbers on the courses. At the end of the summer, we had uh, 1,142 participants. Um, the coaches had developed 84 lessons in these online courses on, on WordPress basis. Um, and um, we had additional 23 live events. So this is what happened until 
late summer 2020. And just to complete the picture, we had an additional summer school in 2021. Actually, when you're seeing this uh, in summer 2021, European summer. Uh, this is um, actually happening right now because we have the summer school until October, November 2021. You can find it all on campus.oercamp.de. Now I would like to tell you something about the We Use strategy. And in this project, we try to focus on the We Usability from the scratch. And maybe this is interesting for some of the OER projects out there. So our this is just a, a visual from, from an OER camp we had in, uh, I don't know, 2019 maybe, um, because we have no visuals from this process because it was very abstract in the beginning. So what we thought was, okay, these webinars have, I don't know, between 10 and 20 participants. And the video on YouTube in the following weeks and months will be seen from, I don't know, between 100, 200, 300. We also had a thousand views on YouTube. So we had to balance it. What's best for the video on YouTube with a thousand views and for the live situation in the webinar with 15 participants? And traditionally, you would say, okay, live goes always first. So it's more important to focus on a good experience during the webinar and not for the view on YouTube. But if you really put it on, on a, a scale between, uh, say, 15 and 1,000 participants' views, it changes somewhat. I think we found a pretty good way to balance these two interests. Uh, and we said, okay, we will focus on how the recording will look like. And during the webinar, we will uh, plan a certain amount of this is the input, this is what we will put on YouTube, and there will be no interaction during this input, which was between 10 and 20 minutes uh, long normally. So the live event also had sharing and questions and discussions, but they were strongly separated from the input part. So this was um, a process that was in the planning, well, I think we learned a lot and Christine will tell you what we did. Like Joran just said, we had a very specific workflow for yeah, the implementation of the web talks. But before starting the web talks and doing the recording, we had a couple of briefings and meetings which were very important. First of all, we were a team of hosts. So it wasn't just me or it wasn't just Joran, but we were a team of five hosts hosting the events. And we wrote down like an agenda so that everyone knew what to say when and what the content of the sentence would be for the introduction. Then again, you saw the colorful tiles beforehand. These were all our OER camp coaches. So we had five per season and we had specific briefings with them as well. So I can give you one insight. What was very important is that we agreed on the very first and the very last sentence so that the video and the input could, st could stand on its own. So for example, the very first sentence of all the inputs should have been something like, hello, welcome to this web talk. The topic today is audio and video production, for example. And we really, really um, insisted during the briefing that our coaches didn't say something like, ah, thanks, Christine, for the introduction. I mean, this is normal interaction also in an online environment, but for the web talks, of course, it was very important that it was a framed input. So the first and the last sentence, for example, were a very important agreement that we did with our coaches. And then again, we had this big briefing beforehand, but we also met approximately 15 to 20 minutes before every web talk started with our coach. We run through the agenda again. We ask if there were questions or something that should have been more clarified or clear. And um, we also rehearsed 
the agenda with them. So we really ask them to say the sentence. It might sound a little bit weird, but for the practical implementation at the end, it was very, very helpful. We didn't mention, but all the recordings that we did were in Zoom. That was quite handy. So Zoom developed a lot of functions that we could use for our webinars. And um, the workflow that we created after the input and the webinar took place uh, was according to the video projection. So just imagine the webinar took place at 7 p.m. So this was one of our webinars taking place in the evening and it lasted until eight o'clock and then right after this we send the zoom recording uh, to the team to our video <laughs> production person and he actually uh, yeah made the beginning and the end of the video so there was some kind of introduction and then we already uploaded it on youtube so approximately at 9 p.m people who couldn't attend the talk because they were having dinner with their family or they have other uh, things to do, they could already watch it. So this is actually a workflow that we did for the whole five weeks and five weeks again. So first meeting with the coach, having a little introduction before the web talk, then the web talk itself, um, like the input part and then the interactive part and afterwards straight away the video production and uploading to YouTube so that people could watch it who couldn't attend the live events. Um, yeah, and many participants actually gave feedback to us that they were happy that they could see it uh, so quickly. And I just mentioned already, so we had YouTube at the platform where you could see the video and you could embed them to the content that you created online. But we also had um, <clears throat> packets uh, that we provided for download. So all of the OER camp um, web talks at the end were bundled into different packages. So one package per season or one package per topic board specifically to say, and you can download them right now. So we provided them with a download link and they are still available and they are also, we licensed them under um, CC BY, the license so that everyone can use them how they would like to use it for their own online courses, for their own blog entries or whatever they feel like. That's it for this video. If you want to learn more about the OER camps, first resource, we have a book. So this is where we actually describe how to OER camp or how to bar camp in general. Of course, it's CC BY license, so you can not only download it, but you also find a rough translation under oercamp.de slash book. And? Of course, we can stay connected. We have a Twitter account, you can follow us there. We also have a YouTube account with a huge amount of videos already we talked about in this video. And if you feel like it, you can of course also send us an email.